our topic today is the center, or right now, this, uh, this particular conference is, uh, you know, Catholics, so what about the rest? Um, so I'm always very dubious about speaking immediately after lunch. <laughs> because you have to fight the digestion. <laughs> so, so we don't have to bother fighting digestion. We'll make this just very short. What about all the rest? They're wrong. Thank you. <laughs> they are not right. And this gets right to the heart of something on the question of truth, objective truth. The Catholic Church makes a number of very simple declarative statements. And it says, this is the case, and it either, it either is, it is, or it isn't. There's no sort of in-between there. There's no in-between, again, as we discussed a little earlier this morning, or alluded to earlier this morning, there's no in-between because there's no in-between in, uh, in the next life. It's either heaven or hell. Why? Because that's the nature of love. Because love is either total or there's no love. How many people in this room want to be half loved? How many people in this room want to be 90% loved? See, love is by its nature complete. And something that's complete and whole contains within itself everything it needs. That's why we say God is love. He has his entire loving relationship within himself. And the nature of love is to explode and create and bring more into the love, and that's the life of God. So, emanating from that life of God is the Catholic Church. And this places the Catholic Church in a unique position vis-a-vis -vis any other religion on the planet. So, the Church makes very bold, definitive, clear-cut statements of love. And they are either true or they are not. Jesus Christ is really, truly, and substantially present under the appearance of bread and wine, body, blood, soul, and divinity, or he is not. There is no in-between with that. There can't be. There can't be. That means that the church has just laid itself out there to make a comment and say, this is the case. Now, believe it or not, those who do, do believe it are Catholic. Those who don't are not. So. How is the church to see or view these other groups? And they're groups, they're not churches. Our blessed Lord established one church. You'll never see him stick an ES on the end of that. One church, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church, one head. Lots of people get upset with that. Lots of people get upset with that. You know, the, if you look at ecumenism and you say the words the way they're really, the letters the way they're really supposed to be said, it's you come inism. <laughs> the Catholic Church is the guaranteed road to salvation. Period. Period. It is the guaranteed road to heaven. Period. Everything else, to one degree or another, falls short. That's not to say that people who are not registered in the parish and getting collection envelopes don't go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. But to the extent that someone is 
in error, and it is error, it's not an opinion, to the extent that someone is in error, if that person is saved, they are saved in spite of their error, not because of it. Because this is the nature of love. Can you imagine, we'll say this, this caused quite a little controversial storm, partly because some people didn't understand it correctly, and then others uh, simply didn't agree with it. But everyone in heaven will be Catholic. Everyone in heaven will be Catholic. Now that doesn't mean only Catholics go to heaven. It means everyone in heaven will be Catholic. Why? Because the church possesses the fullness of the truth and the fullness of that truth is perfected in heaven. Can you imagine a heaven? Can you imagine a heaven where Buddhists, Lutherans, and Catholics are sitting around debating truth? And into the room walks our Blessed Mother. And the Buddhist says, oh, she's a figment of your imagination. And the Lutheran says, well, yeah, but don't get too overboard with her. And the Catholic says, this is our queen. Stand up. There's no debate in heaven. There's no controversy in heaven. Heaven is being in the Trinity. And if you're in the Trinity, then you are in all truth. So there is no uh, debate or discussion or arguing in heaven. Another truth that the Catholic Church asserts is that this community was established by our blessed Lord, of which blessed Peter was made the visible head and his successors, and to it belongs the fullness of truth, and that's it. There's no debate. Well, there's debate, but that's either correct or it's incorrect. It's one or the other. It is or it isn't. There simply cannot be distinctions made with these things. Again, I'm not talking about people going to heaven or not. I'm talking about the concept of objective truth, the fullness of truth, residing in the Catholic Church. And why? Because the Church is, as St. Paul says, the body of Christ on earth. And as Pope Pius later added on, put, inserted the word mystical in front of it, the mystical body of Christ. That means something. That's not just some goofy, you know, people sitting around in some religious, you know, fever inventing terms. That means that Jesus Christ is fully present in this Catholic Church because it is his bride. And the fact that it is his bride tells us everything we need to know. Because for this reason, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. You have set a mouthful when you say that the church is the bride of Christ. The two become one flesh. We'll talk about this later in the um, day. Uh, but just to give you a little indication of this, this is the importance of the Eucharist, which is the reason the importance of the priesthood. Because Jesus Christ comes down from heaven. The second person of the Blessed Trinity comes down from heaven and marries himself to his bride on the altar. This is why, if you go through many of the older, beautiful churches and cathedrals in Europe and some of the ones that weren't destroyed by people who did not like the theology, so they tried to express their, dis their despising of the theology and the architecture. This is why these buildings are left and the altars oftentimes have a baldacchino over them. Do you know what a baldacchino is? Remember in St. Peter's, that great big Bernini's columns, uh, the big twisty things above the high altar in St. Peter's? There are very many little versions of those and smaller versions in different churches, Catholic churches all over the world. Why? What is that thing? What is that baldacchino? It's a four-post bed canopy. 
It's a bed canopy. Because God comes down from heaven and loves his bride on the altar. Bride of Christ. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. When we consume the Eucharist, we become one with Christ. This is either true or it's not. It can't be both ways. And if this is true, if God himself comes down from heaven and physically joins himself to us so that in a manner of speaking, the DNA of God unfolds in our bodies and we unite in mystical, sweet communion with our God, that's the whole ball game. That's the whole ball game because that happens nowhere else. As our blessed Lord said at the Last Supper, I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. He never left. He's always with us there in the Eucharist. And this is the reason that the powers of hell attack the priesthood because the priesthood is the path to the Eucharist and the Eucharist is the path to Christ who is the path to the Trinity to heaven. He who eats my body and drinks my blood has life eternal. He who does not eat my body nor drink my blood has no life within him. This can't be compromised. This is the heart of the faith. There is no more reality, more truer reality in the faith than that one belief right there. That's it. Nowhere in sacred scripture do we encounter, do we see an encounter, or is an encounter recorded where Satan goes up to Jesus and demands something of him. He offers him temptations, when he tempts him in the desert. But at the Last Supper, Satan was very much present at the Last Supper. Sometimes, as we're trying to decipher this war, this battle with the infernal, we have to sometimes kind of try to put ourselves in the mind of the enemy. Don't hang there too long because it's perverse and crooked. But it's good to know your enemy. And we see little traces here and there throughout Scripture. And we know that the enemy was present at the Last Supper. We know because it says when, you know, when our blessed Lord told Judas, you want you do, do quickly. Boom, Satan entered into his heart. So we know he was there lurking about. But we can very much know that every single word that came out of Jesus' mouth, Satan was hanging around there listening. So here we are at the Last Supper. And Lucifer... Satan is already kind of unrolling his plan. It's unfolding. He's got Judas where he wants. Somewhere in the previous few days, uh, he knows, Satan knows, that Judas has already gone and kind of, you know, conspired with this bargain for 30 pieces of silver. He knows all of that. He, he knows all of it. He understands that that's the case. So he sees things kind of moving to their natural end. We have, the, we have a way to kind of read the future ourselves, don't we? We sort of know when something's going to happen, just we kind of look and go, well, this happened and that happened and that happened. Well, barring a miracle, this is going to happen. You see things kind of taking their natural progression. 
because you understand life. Well, if we understand life to that degree with our little pea brain, not even pea brain, pea skin brain that we have, how much more does a creature of an angelic intelligence understand the way the world works? He manipulates much of the world. So he's manipulated the circumstances here 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. He's inflamed the Pharisees and the religious authorities of the day against our Lord. Our Lord even says, you're plotting to kill me, because he knew. They were on the side of Satan. Listen to some of the things our blessed Lord said to the religious authorities of his day. They were all, we're Abraham's children. He said, your father is the devil, and you do your father's will. There is no truth in him. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And you are his offspring. Wow. Wow. So our blessed Lord knows the score very well. And so does Satan. So Satan, is he's got to go. He needs to be off the scene. He needs to be gone. So let's get him gone. And he's sitting there waiting, waiting for an opportunity. How am I going to do this? What's going on? He needs to be gone. Once he's gone, I can get those apostles like that. I'm picking them off even while he's still here. I already got Judas. Those two over there argue about which one of them they think is the greatest. I'll get them. They're easy pickings, low-hanging fruit. But he needs to be gone. So our Lord institutes the Eucharist. And finally, the angelic intelligence gets it. He understands that he's going nowhere. Oh, yeah, he may be crucified, but he understands at that point he's going nowhere. And he presents himself before Christ, and he demands the apostles, Give me those men. I want to sift them like wheat. Because that's how you're going to stay here with them. And I can't have that. You will bring my worldly ruin to my worldly kingdom to an end. No! Give me those men! And our Lord looks over to Peter. Says, Peter, Satan has demanded you. And the you he uses there is all. The plural. He has demanded you so that he may sift you all like wheat. But when you, singular, Peter, have regained your strength, you in turn must strengthen your brothers. The institution of the Eucharist, the birth of the holy priesthood, our Lord's going nowhere. I will be with you until the end of the world. Through our priests, through our sacred pastors who consecrate them. Is there any greater work on earth than to bring Christ physically to his people? It is the priesthood which Satan attacks because it is the priesthood which leads us to Christ. There was a priest once in the vill a village near Assisi who was a notorious, horrible man taking up with prostitutes and everything else and the whole surrounding area knew it. And the people went to St. Francis and they said, you know, you, uh, this guy's horrible, he's rotten, he's evil, he's got prostitutes in and out of the, the house. And Francis said, well, I'll go to him. And he went to him. And St. Francis, with the marks of Christ in his hand, 
went to the priest on his doorstep, grabbed that priest's hands, knelt down, and kissed them. Because those hands bring us to Jesus Christ. There's a reason no other religion has priests, authentic priests. Because no other religion can stand and offer the only acceptable sacrifice to God the Father, which is God the Son. Is this different from everyone else? <laughs> yes, it's different from everyone else. It's the everyone else that we need to evangelize. It's everyone else that we need to bring to this understanding. This is why you're baptized. And that includes bringing priests to this understanding who are so battered by Satan and his agents. This includes bringing bishops to this understanding. Sure, they have some sort of intellectual sense of this, they know it. They've got to run parishes, administer this, take care of that, this committee, that committee, this thing, that thing, oh, this, you know, oh, money, oh, but who's got to do this, oh. Was... You are a priest forever. A priest in heaven, a priest in hell. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We are very different. We are very different. And the world wants to destroy the notion of priesthood because the world is run by Satan. During the height of all the sexual abuse cases in the US back in the early 2000s, um, it went like a dagger through my heart could not flip around Jay Leno, Conan O'Brien, doesn't whatever late night, one thing after another, one joke after another about the priesthood. And you can hear Satan cackling in the background, wringing his filthy claws. The church needs within itself to respond to the revolution that happened in its ranks to diminish the priesthood. There now needs to be a counter-revolution to that. The palace guard has taken over, and the palace guard needs to be dethroned. And what needs to be re-enthroned is the truth. Because in too many places, the truth is made short shrift of. And this one truth necessary for salvation has been swept under the rug. In many parts, it's been swept under the rug by the very men entrusted to it, entrusted to announce it and pronounce it. Everything we do as Catholics is centered around the Eucharist. Everything. The reason you're baptized is so that you can receive Holy Communion. The reason confession exists is so that you can receive Holy Communion. Everything we do as Catholics centers around the Eucharist. What did our blessed Lord do on Easter Sunday? On the first Easter Sunday, he met two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they're all down. So he thought he was the one, and oh, this is horrible, and well, we're going back. We're not quite sure what to do, blah, blah, blah. And our blessed Lord says, oh, how slow of mind, uh, dull of mind and slow of heart you are. And then he says, then the scriptures say, that he then began to explain to them how everything in the scriptures related to him, how the Son of Man must suffer so to enter into his glory. 
and he goes to, uh, and they, on the way, starts to get dark, sits down. They had invited him in. Lord, stay with us, for the day is drawing long and the night is coming. So they're the hosts initially for a brief moment. And then our Lord assumes the position of host. He takes the bread, breaks it, and in those beautiful words of the Holy Spirit echoed to us through Luke, their eyes were opened and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. What did our Lord do on Easter Sunday? He said Mass. He walked out of the tomb and he said Mass. He, ex he explained the readings to them, the liturgy of the Word, and he offered them Holy Communion, liturgy of the Eucharist. And when that was done, he goes to the apostles. Now we know from various accounts that our Lord's been in various places all over this day. He appears to Mary. We know he appears, Mary Magdalene. We know he appears to Peter, singularly, because it says so. When the disciples came tearing back from Emmaus and kicked in the door, oh, we all, God, you can't believe it, oh my God, my. and which you can imagine that would have been what they were like. And they're like, oh, we've just seen him. So, yeah, yeah, we know. He appeared to Peter already. Imagine the buzz in that room. Well, they've seen, those who saw him, and Peter saw him, and Mary Magdalene saw him. Well, I didn't see him yet, but what, what's, going, what, what's going on? It's the craziness that would have been going on in that room. And then all of a sudden, peace be with you. Just close your eyes for a second and imagine that room. Imagine you being in that room. All the hubbub and the, these guys have just kicked in the door. They've run back six miles from Emmaus, probably as fast as their feet could carry them. They kick in the door. Peter obviously had told people he'd seen, told the other apostles he'd seen him. What was going on in that room on Easter Sunday night? The chaos, the craziness. Peace be with you. Our blessed Lord did not say, um, Bartholomew, the last time I saw you, it was your back. And you too, Andrew. <laughs> Philip, I had no idea you could run that fast. <laughs> Peace be with you. And here it comes, evangelizers. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And then he breathed on them. And that word breathe that he says there, the only other time in sacred scripture that that form of that word appears is when he creates Adam. He breathed his life into him. Breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is the first Pentecost. There are two. This is the first. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you hold bound, they are held bound. He establishes the church on Peter. He gives the church its mission right there before the sun has set fully on that first Easter Sunday night. Why do we need forgiveness of sin? Do you see what happens with the passion? From Holy Thursday to Easter Sunday... Our blessed Lord institutes the Holy Eucharist, establishes the priesthood, inaugurates the priesthood, the, the, the uh, full, fullness of the priesthood, and, uh, and then Easter Sunday night institutes the sacrament of confession. And all of this happens as bookend to his passion and death and resurrection. This demands love. There is no way to respond to this other than through love. There's no other way to get to this. There's no other way to hold this truth except to love fully and completely. As the Father sent me from all eternity, I was with him. 
Think about the baptism. What's the relationship between father and son? It's all over the pages of sacred scripture. You can't, particularly the, the uh, Gospels, can't swing a dead cat without hitting something about the relationship between father and son. This is my beloved son, in, him I am well, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Father, glorify your son. I, will, I have glorified you, and I will glorify you again. We are called to that relationship, and no religion on earth even comes close to being able to articulate that infinite, eternal truth other than the Catholic Church. So we do not make compromises with other world religions. We respect them. We accept that this is a reality in a fallen world, but we do not make compromises with the truth. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Is that a compromise? Is that a compromise? If you love me, you will pick up your cross and follow me. Whoever saves his life in this life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will find it. There is no way to be Catholic other than radically Catholic. And anything else is a compromise. Period. You know these truths. You know these truths. They're embedded in your heart. They come to life. They grow inside you every time you receive Holy Communion in a state of grace. Every time you go to confession and are restored to your baptismal purity. These truths grow in you. This, you're, you're lifted up in sanctification. It's the whole reason it exists. You don't get to sit down and not tell this to people. No matter who you have to go to war with, you go to war with them. And I don't mean punching their lights out or yelling mean words at them. I'm talking about you pour yourself out. You pour yourself out every single thing that you can possibly do to save those souls. Whatever it is. And it will cost you because that is the nature of discipleship. It costs. It costs. And it costs everything that you have. Everything. The priesthood exists for this reason. It's the only reason it exists, is to offer sacrifice and forgive sins. That's it. The priesthood does not exist to look over the balance sheets of the bingo club. Which I'm sure Father's very happy to hear that. <laughs> it exists to bring God to his lover and to bring the lover, the beloved, to God. That's it. Anything short of that, any exercise, any understanding of that is deficient. It is deficient. It is wanting. For this reason, Archbishop Fulton Sheen said to the laity a few years before he died, who is going to save our church? It's interesting when you look back, particularly through the last hmm, 10 years or so of Archbishop Sheen's life, he got the disaster that was befalling the priesthood. Again, I'm not talking just about sexual abuse. I mean, first of all, let's clear something up right away. The vast, huge, massive majority of priests never abused any child sexually in their lives at all. And and those who did, God have mercy on them, those who did, uh, did so at a much lower rate of occurrence than virtually any other uh, uh, occupation that deals with children. It's been proven over and over again. So when I'm talking about the disaster that has befallen the priesthood, I'm not talking about you know, a, a relatively small number of men over the course of 50 or 60 years scattered all over the world. 
I'm talking about the lack of the understanding of what the priesthood is. Not the function, not what they do, who they are. Who they are. They are the people called from the rest of us to stand there in persona Christi as alter Christus, as another Christ, and model for us Jesus Christ sacrificing to the Father. They are not administrators. They're not people who count the books. Sure, some of those things may come along with the duties, the functionary duties of the priesthood, but that is not the essence of the priesthood. These men will stand before Jesus Christ because they were called by Jesus Christ. And they will give an account for every action that they may have done or not done that led souls to our blessed Lord because that is why he commissioned them. Do we think for one moment that Satan in all his gall goes up to the second person of the Blessed Trinity and demands something from him face to face? That if he would do that at that supreme moment of the Last Supper, that he does not do that now every single day in every corner of the world in every priest's life that, there, that walks the earth right now? Of course he does. He's all about destroying the priesthood. Because he knows what the priesthood accomplishes. And the fullness of the priesthood is accomplished and lived in the office of the bishop. Why? Why do we see so much destruction and chaos and disagreement, some of it vitriolic, within the works and the realm of the hierarchy because Satan has slithered in and sown discord. Now, this is certainly nothing new. He did this even before the apostles and our blessed Lord gathered in the upper room for the Last Supper. Did it with Judas. And if you go down through history, we will see that Every single heresy that comes about in the body of Christ comes about through someone who is a member of the ordained class. The laity doesn't start heresies. We don't have the authority or, the, or we don't even have the mechanism to do it. We have no mechanism to do it. I suppose I could try to start one here. Hey, 150 people, you want to join the Church of Mike? Let's go. Woohoo! That's called a Protestant. Because they are the guardians of the truth, the bishops and priests, and obviously deacons as well, because they are the guardians of truth, they are going to be the ones who take the incoming rounds the strongest. Satan knows that if he destroys the priesthood, he destroys the Eucharist. He destroys the Eucharist. He destroys our physical access to God. It is God himself who desired that we be united to him physically as well as spiritually. And if he desired that, then that is what we do. Matter of fact, he commanded us to eat my flesh, period. The second shortest sentence in sacred scripture, the first one is, Jesus wept. So if our blessed Lord desires this, he doesn't desire it willy-nilly. Everything our blessed Lord does, he desires so that we be saved. Everything he does, everything he says, is geared to our salvation. And if he says, eat my flesh, then that is intimately tied to our salvation. Can't eat his flesh without Holy Communion. Can't have Holy Communion without the priesthood. Can't have the priesthood without the bishops. And you can't have the bishops without that apostolic succession and that union to Peter. A bishop's role is to be united to Peter. Period. It is to be united to Peter. A priest's role 
is to be united to his bishop. Our blessed Lord established this, not man. And insofar as that union is solid, then things run relatively fine and smooth. But when that union is broken, and there are many ways to break it, so one doesn't have to set fish, sit down and write an official letter and hold it up. That's one way. But there are many ways to break trust and accord. Some of those ways are to sit silent as your sheep are devoured. Our blessed Lord never really used adjectives that much. Matter of fact, if you look at what our Lord says very frequently, they're very usually very direct kind of comments. They aren't really that flowery. Uh, they're beautiful and they're profound, but they're very simple. And he doesn't really use adjectives that much. But one of the exceptional times he did is when he was talking about false prophets. And when he was talking about wolves going after the flock, he didn't just use the term wolves, he used the term ravenous wolves, which paints a pretty scary picture of a wolf salivating at the mouth, fangs ready to tear apart, ready to rip and kill and destroy. This is what happens to someone who betrays his high office. Bishop, priest, or deacon. They become ravenous wolves. Not my words, our blessed Lord's words. Because our Lord understands the nature of the conflict. He understood from the very beginning in the garden when he turns to the serpent, when the Holy Trinity turns to the serpent and says, I will put hatred between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and you will lie in wait and strike at her heel, and she will crush your head. Our blessed Lord knew from all eternity what the cost would be. He knew what the war would be. He knew everything about it. This is why he gives us the priesthood, so that we can receive him, him. I will not leave you orphans. I will come back to you. Yeah, this makes us very different from everyone else. And it charges us to bring as many people into this as we can because it is the will of the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.